All right. Good afternoon and happy Sunday. This is Ask a Priest Live with Father George Elliott. Uh, welcome. It's good to have you. So I'm going to go ahead and share on the platform that I'm supposed to. Uh, and we'll get started here in a minute. If you have not already, please go ahead and grab your rosary. We'll get started with the Divine Mercy Chaplet and then go from there. Good stuff. So to everybody who's plugged in, welcome. It's good to have you. Uh, please go ahead and type into the comments where you're from. Um, say hello to everybody that's watching. And also, you know, share, like, subscribe, do all of the things um, to engage and uh, help to just get the video out as much as you can. Uh, also, if you have a question now, I can see Brian on YouTube has already posted one question. So go ahead and put that in there. Uh, and when I'm done with the uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet and also the reflection on the readings, I'll get to those questions. Good stuff. I can see Rosie has uh, already commented in from Bakersfield, California. Great to have you. Good stuff. So let's start with the Divine Mercy Chaplet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I free the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, 
have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, the soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us and on the whole world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, I trust in you. All right, good stuff. Welcome to everybody who has plugged in since we got started uh, this afternoon. Um, this is Ask a Priest Live with Father George Elliott on Catholic Link. Um, and so we just finished with the Divine Mercy Chaplet and we'll get on to the reflection on the day's readings here in a minute. Um, if you haven't already, please comment in where you're connecting from. It's fun to see the, the international community that we have on this live uh, feed. And also, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, place them in right now. Uh, I'll just kind of work through them as, as quickly as I can. There's a little bit of a delay from when you type it in to when I can actually see it. So if you get it in now, then that allows us to, to move through more questions more quickly and hopefully spread the, the faith to more people. Also, speaking of that, uh, if you could you know, share this to any groups uh, that you're a part of, uh, you can share it on your own feed. Make sure and you know, like and react and subscribe and share and all of those things that increases engagement and basically just brings the truth of, of the church to more people. Uh, so that would be much appreciated. Good stuff. I'm going to just go through real quick. Um, looks like we've got some questions in already. Uh, Brion is here. We've got uh, Jessica from Nacogdoches. Good to have you. And Suzette, great to have you. Good stuff. Oh, it looks like uh, so Jonathan... Um, is asking for prayers for his father-in-law, uh, Santiago Acosta, who is currently in the ICU battling COVID pneumonia and is now on a ventilator. He's been in the hospital since January 12th. Uh, Jonathan will definitely be, um, be praying for you and for, for your father-in-law, Santiago. Yeah, thanks for posting that. Um, Edith, good to have you. And Rosie as well is asking for prayers for her husband and son, um, Matthew. Oh, wow. Uh, both passed away. Definitely. Absolutely. We'll be praying, um, praying for them. Sorry to hear that. And, all right. Anna is connected. Good to have you. Julie as well. Rose from Nacogdoches, Texas. Good regular. It's great to have you. Um, and the hermano Christian Maria Carvajal. Good to have you. Welcome, Fran. Welcome, welcome. And Janice from Timpson, it's always a pleasure to have you as well. Red, to answer your question, yes, this is still live. He was asking uh, if it's still live because he's got a question. So go ahead and post that in right now, and we'll get to it as soon as we can. Um, also, Christopher, uh, um, yeah, he's uh, just saying to really pray for God, uh, pray to God and ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man. He'll heal uh, in Jesus. 
his name. Yeah, absolutely. Pray for his, his intercession. And, you know, most importantly, obviously, we, we want healing uh, for our loved ones. But the most important thing is uh, really for their, their faith. You know, this life on earth is going to end eventually. Um, you know, we, <laughs> I think most of us wouldn't mind having a little bit longer, especially uh, a little bit longer for our, our loved ones. Um, but, you know, we were made for eternal life. And so pray first and foremost for, for the grace for them to, um, you know, draw close to God and um, for that, that life of grace to, to blossom into eternal life in heaven. Um, but definitely pray for healing as well. You know, God does miraculous things. All right. Uh, Yes, um, read absolutely, post away. Um, great, Rosa from New Jersey, good to have you. And Teresa and uh, Deacon David from Catholic Neck, welcome, welcome. Um, good, get some more questions in. And Lucy from Annapolis, Maryland, welcome. And Eileen from Scotland, another good regular, it's great to have you. Good, so let's go ahead and look at the, um, look at the readings. There are some really interesting things in the in the readings this weekend. I actually had a hard time figuring out what I was going to preach on because there's so many fun things to talk about. Um, but this time, um, I would uh, like to just focus on the line, uh, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kin and will put my words into his mouth. He shall tell them all that I command him. So, uh, as you all know, when we are baptized, we're baptized into Jesus Christ, who is priest, prophet, and king. We, we too are made priests, prophets, and kings. Um, and when I listen to, to Catholic speakers, I hear them talk a lot about uh, Jesus Christ being the high priest, right? That's really clear. And then also um, being the king. But we don't hear a ton about Jesus being a prophet. And so uh, the first thing that we need to understand is what do we mean by Jesus being a prophet? You know, in, in modern times when we hear prophet, we think of somebody who um, prophecies, who, who tells us about the future. But really, uh, the Hebrew word uh, for prophet is, um, it's, it's not necessarily just a, a fortune teller, right? That, there, there's a different word for that. The prophet was, um, it was specifically somebody who speaks on behalf of God that, uh, you know, it says in the first reading, you know, if we were to hear the voice of the Lord, uh, yeah, let us not hear again the voice of the Lord, lest we die. That, you know, if we were to actually hear the voice of the Lord, we would die. And so the Lord uses these prophets to speak his words on his behalf. And Jesus Christ uh, was specifically one of those, you know, God, he's obviously a very unique prophet because he also is God. There's one divine person, um, Jesus Christ. Well, there are three total, but uh, in Jesus, there's one divine person, uh, and the divine nature, and the human nature. And by his human nature, he could speak to us in human terms. Um, and so he, he speaks on behalf of God, uh, the divinity, through his humanity. Um, and so he is considered to be the definitive revelation of God, that after Jesus Christ revelation was completed there is nothing new that will be revealed and that's why it says here and he shall tell them all that i command him well uh, jesus christ was is god and so this is in a sense saying god saying i will communicate everything to you at all that i intend to communicate communicate to humanity i will communicate through this new prophet who is to come namely jesus christ um and so this impacts a lot of different things. First off, uh, you know, we have the fullness of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. So you can think about that kind of in a, in a spiritual mystical sense that um, God revealed himself. He gave of himself completely in Jesus Christ. Um, and so we can come to know God uh, to the full, fullest that we can as human beings in and through Jesus Christ. And so... When we think about spirituality, when we think about prayer, uh, any kind of prayer that separates itself from Jesus Christ, who is the one mediator, um, now that doesn't mean that we can't, uh, you know, pray to the Holy Spirit, that we can't um, ask the saints to intercede for us, because they too are in and through Jesus Christ. Um, 
but uh, if we begin to kind of separate ourselves from Jesus Christ, specifically as he became man, uh, then we should be very, very weary of that kind of prayer because Jesus Christ in his divinity and his humanity revealed the fullness of the Godhead to us. Also, um, you know, there can be these kind of, um, or there, can, there can be this, this culture that builds up around certain revelations and things of the sort uh, where they, you know, the blessed mother appeared or this other saint appeared or this, you know, person started having these visions or hearing voices or whatever it may be. Um, and people get really, really excited about these things. And, you know, they, they almost begin to study the, the revelations more than they study the Bible, more than they study the catechism, more than they study what Jesus Christ revealed. They start looking at, you know, what this other person revealed. Um, but we receive everything that we actually need for salvation from Jesus Christ. And so that should be the absolute center. These other supernatural phenomena that um, appear to be occurring, first off, we can never be completely certain that they are actually from God. Um, you know, it says in the scriptures that the, the angel of darkness can, um, can make himself appear to be an angel of light. And uh, the church, even whenever it approves, so to speak, a certain um, apparition, it is really just saying that in the contents of this apparition, there is nothing that is contrary to the faith. So the church doesn't really even say that anybody appeared at that time or that anything actually happened. They just say that, well, the information that came from it isn't contrary to the faith. That's what it means that an apparition is approved by the church. Um, and so that doesn't mean that therefore we should deny all apparitions or anything of the sort, but it does mean that, um, you know, we, we shouldn't put as much emphasis on what's revealed in, in some of those apparitions, they can kind of highlight important parts of what Jesus Christ already revealed um, for our times. Um, but really the focus should be completely on what's revealed through uh, scripture and tradition and defined by the magisterium. So uh, hopefully that helps to clarify some things in everybody's mind. And it actually um, kind of transitions well into a question that was asked to me last week about um, illumination of conscience and um, uh, the great warning. So the great warning or the, the illumination of conscience comes from Garbandal, which is a, uh, an approved apparition in Spain uh, of the Blessed Mother. And in Garbandal, they saw all sorts of other stuff. The Blessed Mother was just part of it. Um, uh, and one of the things that was talked about is the, the great aviso, right? They're speaking in Spanish, so the great warning or the um, kind of like letting you know. Um, and this great warning is, they, they spoke of it as it's the illumination of conscience. And so uh, it will come shortly before the end times uh, and everybody will personally experience within themselves an awareness of their own sinfulness. The person will be alone before God. Um, and that will be a kind of wake up call, so to speak, to every individual human being. Um, exactly how long it will take, the, it wasn't really clarified. Um, some of the visionaries said it would be somewhere around um, five to 15 minutes, uh, but um, we really just don't have a lot of details on it. Um, I am of the kind of tendency to say, well, excellent. If that's something that's going to happen regardless to everybody, and it is going to convict us of our own sinfulness, then I don't need to worry too much about the great warning. I mean, if it happens during my lifetime, um, it's definitely going to be a terrifying moment, uh, but it will happen regardless. And so I don't need to like, prepare myself for it any more than I already know that I should be preparing myself for it, namely by living a holy life, um, fulfilling the duties of my state in life, um, striving to, to love God and to love neighbor above, um, you know, with, with everything that I do and to, to really do the will of our Lord. And then hopefully whenever that illumination of conscience comes, um, it's, there's, there's a lot less to be illumined, we'll say. Um, and so hopefully that, uh, answers the question a little bit more clearly. Uh, thank you for, for posting that. Great. So on YouTube, Brian Lo Robledo 
uh, asks the question, could a priest come back to the priesthood after going to war in the military with just his prayers and his Bible? Um, so I'm not entirely sure exactly what uh, situation you're talking about, but to answer the question, um, so uh, priests can enter into the military either as priest chaplains um, or the military will take a priest as just another soldier, usually he's made an officer because priests have um, you know, college degrees usually. Um, and however, the, the Catholic Church with the eyes of faith says, well, what is the best way that a priest can serve at a time of war? Well, as a priest, right? I mean, the soldiers need the sacraments at the last moments of their life. Um, they need the, the hope and the love of Jesus Christ because you know, war is an ugly thing. It's a, it's a difficult thing. It's not the ugliest of things, but it's ugly. Um, and and uh, that can cause a kind of despair and a lack of faith in those soldiers. And so they need the light of Christ in particular, and they need, they need priests to be there. Um, and so the, the Catholic Church kind of frowns on um, priests becoming like foot soldiers, um, but they don't frown at all in priests uh, you know, supporting those who are in the military. Um, and so he can come back afterwards. Uh, that that has happened. There, there have been a, a handful of, of priests who have done those things, um, it, you know, going and becoming just a kind of foot soldier, so to speak. Um, but then there are very many soldier, uh, priests who become priest chaplains and they work as chaplains in the military for a while. And then they eventually come back to their diocese or their religious order and continue serving in that way. Great. Good question, Brian. All right. Okay. Scrolling through. Great. So Crystal Hoy Hoy says, Hi, Father George. Did Pope Francis give the go-ahead for female acolytes this last week? Um, yes, is the, the short answer. Uh, both. So the question is kind of, what is an acolyte? Um, so this is not just your, your average altar server. Uh, there are two ministries, is what they're referred to, uh, in the Catholic Church uh, today. Um, those ministries actually come from what are called the minor clerical orders. So usually when you hear the word cleric in Catholic circles, that's in reference to a, a bishop, a priest, or a deacon. However, um, throughout the history of the church, a whole number of other what are called minor clerics, so the bishop, priest, deacon is, is major clerics, and then the minor clerics um, were a whole, a whole number of orders in which th there were young men who typically were being formed for the priesthood or at least for some sort of more formal service in the church uh, would, would pass through step by step in their formation and as needed. And so um, tonsure was the first step uh, into becoming a minor cleric, and then there were uh, porters and uh, lectors and exorcists. They wouldn't actually do like exorcisms, though their role was to assist in that and specifically to pray um, for the liberation of people. Um, and then acolytes, and then there was subdeacon as well, which if you've been to an extraordinary form mass, that role, a, a solemn high mass in the extraordinary form, that role of the subdeacon is still very clear and obvious. Um, and then after subdeacon was deacon, priest, and, and bishop. Um, so what happened is with the Second Vatican Council, they, they suppressed the minor orders. So the, from tonsure all the way through subdeacon, all kind of went away canonically at least. Um, and they replaced that, that with two things. One was the uh, ministry of acolyte, and the other was the ministry of lector. Um, and so those ministers were still lay people uh, and lay people that had no intention of becoming priests could receive those. However, in the seminary, we all receive lector and acolyte at you know, certain points. Um, and so it was kind of quasi preserved as this like, preparation for the priesthood, but not quite. And uh, it, because of that, it was also reserved only to men. And so Pope Francis said, okay, nope, we're gonna open this up 
to women now, so both lectors and acolytes as instituted ministers um, are, are open to women now. Uh, the main purpose of the lector is obviously to, to read the readings at mass, and the acolyte has a kind of dual purpose. Um, the, the, the main one is actually more in regard to kind of the extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. So acolytes are still considered extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, um, however they would be the least extraordinary and so after the bishop priest and deacon if you still need more ministers uh, the first ones that you would turn to would be the acolytes and then after that um, you could ask you know any any practicing catholic to be a eucharistic minister uh, as an extraordinary minister um, so hope the answer yeah short answer is is yes and it's um i don't know We'll see how the whole thing un unrolls or yeah, develops. All right, Lucy from Annapolis, it's good to have you. Okay, Red uh, wrote, my father died in 2012 from a brain tumor and it troubled my faith a lot. He was a good man and I don't understand why God took him. Red, yeah, first off, my condolences. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question it's, and it's common that before uh, death or before any difficult experience, we, we ask the question, why? Why did this happen? And when it's outside of the natural order, so you know, when someone dies at a younger age, we, we ask it even more strongly and just say, you know, what is going on? Why, why is this possible? Um, and in regard to, to death and really for, for pretty much every evil, um, the simple answer is, is sin. Um, you know, why did this happen well because sin exists as it says in the scriptures um, the wages of death is sin and so all death entered the world because of sin um, and you know you can understand that kind of in a, in a general way but also in a very concrete way you know one of the effects of the sin of Adam and Eve is a kind of disorder within humanity and so even within ourselves there began to be this this disorder where our, our body just doesn't function quite like it's supposed to reproduction sometimes doesn't happen right and there are you know problems with chromosomes and dna and all of that and you can see uh, um, several diseases that then cause that unnatural early death um, coming from the essentially a disorder within the human body then uh you know, there are some other cases kind of on the, on the far side. So that, that's, that's where you can see, okay, sin causes a disorder within the world and within humanity. Um, and so that causes some disease and death and suffering. Um, and then kind of on the far other side, you can see things um, like, you know, war and murder and um, things of that sort, where it was very clear that there was a human being that, uh, you know, made a, an evil choice that then caused suffering in some way. Um, but right in the middle, there is a, I think a little bit difficult, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to see. And this example of your father, you know, any, anybody that has cancer or things of that sort, it's, uh, it's harder to pin down because the, the connection, the correlation is not quite as obvious. Um, but I, I do think it's striking that at least here in the United States, um, and actually you mentioned, uh, Las, you were from Las Vegas, I think. Um, there were a number of nuclear tests that were done in, I think it was actually in Nevada. Um, and, you know, it was while the United States was developing the atomic bomb and didn't really know what it did or how it worked or anything of that sort. And so they were, they were setting these nuclear bombs off kind of out in the middle of the desert. And, um, you know, they eventually shut down that testing because they realized, oh, wow, there are some long-term effects with the radiation that can cause some unhealthy things, and so we need to stop doing this. Um, but in the areas that are essentially downwind of that nuclear testing site, uh, they found that there were significantly higher rates of cancer and also of birth defects um, among those communities. Once again, uh, it was not really those people's fault, but because of you know the unwise decision 
the, the evil choice of somebody else up the ladder that, hey, we're not really sure we're gonna, how this works, and so we're just going to start blowing it up and see what happens. Um, that then also caused great suffering and death in those communities. Um, and, you know, we can say, okay, great, yeah, sin is the cause of death, but why is there sin? Um, and the, the answer to that is because God chose to grant to humanity um, something that he chose never to take away and that nobody else could take away. You know, our, our free will, our ability to choose can never be taken from us. There are many things that can be taken from us. People can take away our property. They can take away our health. Um, we can lose friends. We can lose family members. We can lose, um, you know, our reputation. We can even lose our, our memory, our, our intellect, our ability to think. But, um, they, you know, people can take away even our ability to move around, right? You can be put in prison or you know, chained up or whatever it may be. But what nobody can ever take away from us is our choice, our free will. And so God gave us this gift of a free will well, that is um, most us, you know, because nobody else can take it. Um, and it's in that free will that we can love, we can give of ourselves, because it's that free will that is most ourselves. Um, and that is actually the most beautiful thing about humanity, that we can, we can love at a level that is so much deeper, uh, so much more profound than any animal can or any other thing in the world. Um, and so while uh, sin has caused great evil, uh, the kind of the other side of the coin, love has also created the, the, the greatest things, the most beautiful things in all of our life. And actually it's a, it's a beautiful thing that you're struggling with the fact that you're father passed away because it's clear that you do love him um, and, and you shared that love with him while you were uh, together here on earth. Um, and in fact, Jesus Christ was the one who took that love and, and in a sense um, incarnated it. He, he became man, God himself, who is love, God is love, um, became man and out of love put death to death on the cross so that the, the gates of heaven can be opened once again, and that life and that love that we were created for is um, open to us in an infinite way. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's difficult, it's painful, there is suffering, and um, as Catholics, I actually really encourage people who have gone through difficult times to, to kind of lean into the suffering and, and recognize, yeah, no, this stinks. The world, it's, I mean, yeah, it's good, but it's very fallen. And there's, there's a lot of not good in the world. There's a lot of evil in the world. And that is why we live our lives as Catholics. Uh, because first off, we recognize that there is evil in the world, but there's hope in eternity. That we, in fact, through our own sins, cause the part of the evil in the world. And so we live lives of, of penance and mortification and we make reparation and satisfaction for uh, our sins of the past. And we are constantly struggling to, to grow in holiness, to not commit those sins, because we want to diminish um, as much as we can the evil in the world, so that at least those around us and those who come after us don't have to suffer as we have. And that really is a great act of love. Good, good question. I'll be sure to, to pray for your father as well, Red. All right. Okay, yeah, I just saw there, um, and Red said, and I still grieve him, though I'm told I should be over it. He prayed before he died, first time I saw him cry. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a beautiful way to pass away, you know, to, in prayer. That's a, I don't, <laughs> can't really think of a better way to go. Um, and, you know, so it's uh, been about eight, eight years, nine years, um, and so, Hopefully, yeah, there, there should be a certain amount of, you know, you can function um, after that period of time. But 
you know, the, the sense of being over it in the sense that it, it doesn't hurt. Um, I don't know that that's the case at all. Uh, you know, when, when our loved ones pass away, we love them and we miss them and it's, it's difficult for us and um, kind of allowing that uh, process of mourning and suffering to happen is a, is a good thing. And of course you can offer that suffering up for the happy repose of his soul. Now, after we die, uh, we go before our Lord and um, hopefully we are judged to go to eternity, uh, to eternal beatitude in heaven. Um, and if we need it, uh, we have some form of purification in the state that we call purgatory after death and before arriving into heaven. Um, and those who are on earth can help those who are in that state of purgatory being, being purified of their sins before they go to heaven. And so it's important to offer up sacrifices and prayers for uh, our loved ones and for all the souls in purgatory um, so that they can enjoy eternal beatitude. And it's a great act of, of love and of charity for them as well. You know, um, they can't help themselves, so uh, we can do what we can to help them. All right. Great question, Red. So Anna asks the question, do you think saying I know is better than I believe? Um, so I'm, I'm going to assume that you're talking about in the context of faith. Um, it's, it's complex. Um, you know, with communication always, uh, there is the, the situation of not only the one who is communicating, but also the one who is uh, being communicated to. Um, and so when we communicate, we have to communicate also in a certain sense in the mode of the receiver so that they can receive it best and that it can really penetrate into the depths of their heart. And so, uh, you know, in regard to faith, uh, we should have a, a certainty of faith. And in fact, once we have, once we are certain of what has been revealed, we have the great, or sorry, once we have certainty that a certain thing has been revealed, then we have the greatest certainty that we can possibly have in that because that is the, the word of God, you know, and God can't lie. He is truth himself. He is omniscient. And so if he knows all things and he cannot lie, then whenever he reveals something, whenever he speaks in a certain way, uh, then we can be absolutely certain of that. And so we do know that even more than we know you know, the reality of our own existence and, you know, the fact that two plus two equals four, um, it's, it's absolute certainty that, that we have um, when God speaks. And so it's okay to say, I know. Uh, and when you're in a Catholic setting where everybody has faith and all of that, saying, I know this is the case is a perfectly fine thing to say. Um, when you are in a setting in which people... Uh, don't necessarily share the same belief as you saying something like I know can be kind of off-putting um, and stating it more from the first person point of view of I believe or this is how I understand it um, can be much more effective getting that to them and see your point of view and hopefully then they can embrace your point of view but if you say like no I know this is the case um, sometimes uh, they see that as kind of um, commanding or, uh, yeah, a little bit too um, definitive and that, that puts them very defensive and then that's kind of the end of the conversation. Um, good question, Anna. Leslie says, hi, Eva, great to have you as well. <laughs> Gary says, 10 out of 10 would recommend going to a, an extraordinary form mass. Yeah, it really is beautiful. We recently just had a um, a solemn high requiem mass, which is really quite beautiful. All right, Matthew asks, uh, he says, Hi, Father, is it proper to bring a written list of sins to confess into the confessional? Also, why is it required to state the number of times a sin was committed? I'm always concerned I'll forget something. Really good question. So it is uh, absolutely permissible to, re to bring a written list of sins uh, to confess in the confessional. Um, in fact, I, I find, especially for people who get a little bit nervous or um, who you know, have a, a number of sins, if it's been a while since you've gone to confession and you have a lot to, to get out, um, writing them down can be really, really helpful. Or if you just find that you get nervous and forget things in confession, which 
happens to a lot of people. It's good to write them down to make sure that you make a good confession. Um, obviously, don't put your name on it or anything like that, because then somebody will find it. It's like, what's, <laughs> what's this? Um, uh, in regard to um, stating the number of times a sin was committed, so one clarification is that's only in regard to mortal sins. Uh, it's not in, in regard to venial sins. And the reason why we have to uh, say the number of times that we committed a mortal sin is that we have to make what's called a, a complete confession. So if you think of confession as um, a kind of moment of reconciliation with God in which we're coming before God and we're saying, God, I destroyed our relationship. And so I want to ask for forgiveness for these ways that I destroyed our relationship. Or, you know, I want to remove all of these barriers that I placed between me and you. If we think about sin, uh, you know, a mortal sin, every time we commit it, it puts up another one of those barriers. Every time we commit it, it's, um, it's kind of, it's, it's crucifying to our Lord, you could say. Um, and so if we weren't to say the number of times, uh, at least insofar as we can remember, right? So that's one important thing. God doesn't ask us to do what is impossible. And so when we go to confession, we just make the best confession that we can. And if we miss up on the number of times, or if we forget something, then, you know, bring it to the next confession if you, if you do remember, but you know, don't fret about it. If you really just don't remember, our Lord understands that you did your best to restore that relationship. Um, but if we were to go and we were to say, oh, yeah, Lord, you know, I'm sorry for um, doing X, right? I, I stepped on a caterpillar. That's not a mortal sin, but that's my example. I stepped on a caterpillar. Um, the assumption is that's just one time. Um, and if it was only one time, then, uh, well, what about all of the other times that you stepped on a caterpillar? Like those offended me as well. And so you're not sorry, just, or you, you don't need to just kind of um, restore the relationship for the one time that you did this, but we actually need to remove all of those barriers. Um, and so part of making a complete confession is saying, not only did I do this once, I did it, you know, 20 times. Um, and then also making sure that you confess every single one of your mortal sins that you've committed since the last confession, because you know, going up to someone and saying, hey, yeah, so I know I did, you know, these five different things, but I'm sorry really only for these three. Can we be friends now? I answered, no. <laughs> you still completely offended me by these other things. Like, we need to, we need to deal with all of the five. Um, and so that's what we do whenever we make a confession in both number, so that's the number of times that we committed the sin, and kind, the kind of sin that we committed. All right, good question. Okay, so Michaela, good to have you. Uh, Janice asks the question, are there no longer Monsignors? So Monsignors have been restricted significantly. Before, uh, the, the restrictions to be named a Monsignor were, were very, very minimal. Um, I think there was a, a minimum amount of time that you had to be ordained a priest to be named a Monsignor, but it was something like five or 10 years. Um, and then aside from that, essentially your bishop just had to request that you be named a Monsignor by the Pope. And as long as he had a good reason, the Holy Father would name somebody a Monsignor. Um, now you have to be, I think it's at least 65 years old. So it's toward the end of a priest's active ministry. Uh, or, this is kind of funny, you have to have worked in the Holy See for five years. So you can be a brand new priest, have it worked in the Holy See for five years and be named a Monsignor, or you have to be really, really old. Um, and those are not really, really old, but, you know, towards the end of your priestly career, career ministry, public ministry. Um, uh, and so, you know, for the vast majority of priests, basically, they're just not even eligible to, to have that requested. And because it's a less, much less common thing now, much less bishops are requesting it. They're, they're sending up that request a lot less often to the Holy See. Um, and so they're just in general becoming um, much less common. Good question. All right. Paige asks the question, if the Trinity uh, all share the same nature, but is also distinctly three persons. Oh, good. An easy question. Why does Jesus say, 
not my will, but yours. Does this make two wills? Oh my gosh, Paige. All right. Good question. She's one of the college students at St. Mary's. We have great formation there, right? She asked these types of questions. Um, let me think. I have to remember. There is a really good theological answer, but I don't think about the multiplicity or non-multiplicity of wills in Jesus Christ very often. Um, okay, yeah. So, uh, it is interpreted in a few different ways. The important points to hold are that, uh, no, Jesus Christ Christ has uh, one will in the sense that uh, the, the, the two are always in accord. So his human will never uh, deviated from the divine will. But because he did have a complete human nature, that means he did have a human will. Um, and so his what's referred to philosophically as his intellectual appetite in his human nature. So essentially the, the highest part of his intellect or the, the highest form of a will that we could talk about in his humanity um, was always in accord with the divine will. Uh, however, it does seem that, you know, there was a certain part of him that, was, that like, didn't want to suffer. And so we, we talk about we have an intellectual appetite, but we also have a sense appetite. And the sense appetite is at the level of uh, our being that we share with animals. It's in our sense of the sensible part of our soul. And within the sensible part of our soul, because of our emotions and um, because of pain and pleasure and what are um, philosophically referred to as the, the irascible and concupiscible appetites, in common parlance, we kind of refer to those as our emotions. Um, those uh, those create a kind of will um, within us. And so uh, Jesus is recognizing in that prayer that the, the lower parts of his humanity, um, namely that are not intellectual and that are more wrapped up in the body than in the soul, uh, those are drawn him away from suffering because that's actually something that's created into our human nature that our emotions push us away from suffering because that's a kind of knee-jerk reaction that we have um, to preserve our lives oftentimes when we suffer it's because something bad is happening to us and um, you know on the natural level we ought to pre preserve our life and so um, the emotions were created to help us to preserve our life and Jesus felt that emotional or that sense appetite pull um, away from the suffering that he was about to undergo. But that prayer of him in the, in the garden was specifically not this lower sense appetite, but rather um, my intellectual appetite, my, my intellectual will, um, which is always in accord with the divine will. That's the will that I want to be done. Good question. Whew. All right. Glad I remember that. All right. Okay. Uh, Mariela from Colombia. Good to have you. Great. Ma Michael also Robertson from Scotland. Good to have you. Another good regular. And Umar says, hello. Uh, Rose asks the question, what is the age for a bishop? The Beaumont Diocese has a new awesome bishop, and he is very young. Yeah, there is a, a, a new bishop down there in Beaumont, and he's a, a young guy. I'm trying to remember what the minimum age is. So I know that it's not by divine law. So essentially, uh, you know, as long as you can be ordained a priest, you can be ordained a bishop um, as far as divine law goes, right? But then there are the restrictions that the church kind of puts on that. Um, and... Um, I, I have to be. Honest, I I don't think about it very often. <laughs> Not really interested in being a bishop or of the things of bishops. I mean, I listen to my bishop because he's my bishop, um, but uh, I don't think about it a lot. I want to say it's right around thirty or thirty-five. I think it also has to do with I think you have to be ordained a, a, a priest a certain amount of time. Um, but I will research that and get back to you, Rose. Okay. Cool. So. Uh, Good question, Rose. Teresa asks the question, my brother's opinion of Mary's role at the wedding feast was to validate her as being the mother of Jesus because he had been considered illegitimate. 
she and Joseph were betrothed, would they have been thought of that way? Good question. Um, so, uh, I, I don't completely understand how Mary's role at the wedding feast would have validated her. Oh, perhaps um, because it says in the gospel that Jesus and his mother were there. So maybe that's what um, we meant there. Uh, I'm not sure on that. One. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what is meant on that one. Um, but whether or not Jesus would have been considered illegitimate, you know, it would have been a, it, a lot of people would have asked questions. However, there are a few things that um, would have confused exactly when Jesus was born uh, for the people in Nazareth. So if you remember, uh, Mary at the Annunciation was told that Elizabeth was with child. And uh, I believe she was already six months pregnant at that point. Um, and so Mary went down and lived with Elizabeth for at least three months. Uh, then assumably she would have been betrothed to Joseph, or she would have actually been married. They would have had the marriage ceremony with Joseph. And, you know, women, especially at the time, they wore kind of loose fitting clothes. And so it wouldn't have been extremely obvious that uh, she was with child. Um, then they traveled all the way down to uh, Bethlehem, and we don't know exactly when they went down to Bethlehem, but we do know that they were there when Jesus was born, and that they were still living in the um, in the stable, not really a stable, in the, the, the place where the animals live, right? Because Jesus was placed in the major. Um, and uh, then they eventually moved into a house. But when they arrived in Bethlehem, they would have already been married. And so unless somebody was being really nosy and asking all sorts of questions about dating, you know, like, well, exactly when did you guys get married? And how old is this baby? And was it really nine months and all that? Um, you know, it would have, basically nobody would have really known. And then from Bethlehem, they went to Egypt for a handful of years uh, and then went back to Nazareth. And so Jesus at that point would have been four, five, six years old, seven years old, um, kind of depending on, on the dating and how all of that works. But, uh, you know, he would have been older and it would have been well past that time where people would have been asking too many questions. They just would, you know, there's a possibility that it would not have been a, a broadly known thing that essentially the math didn't check out with Mary and Joseph's um, wedding and the birth date of Jesus. It would have been very close, but, but uh, it would have been hard to tell. So um, whether or not Jesus was actually considered to be an illegitimate child is not really very provable, uh, according to the scriptures. However, that, um, you know, some people were maybe asking questions. Um, yeah, that's, that's a possibility. Whether or not that's why Mary was at the wedding feast, um, I don't really... I, I don't understand why she had to be at the wedding feast and not, like, it couldn't have been talked about at any other time. You know, there are multiple other times when um, Mary was referred to as the mother of, of Jesus at, at other times, but also, yeah, because, I mean, the illegitimacy would have had more to do with Joseph. Anyway, not sure. Um, if you want to explain what the thought is behind that, I can comment a little bit more clearly. Good question, Teresa. Great. Um, Tamara from Atlanta says, hello. Good to have you, Tamara. All right. Rose Maria says, Father, I've been battling cancer for, cancer for four years, and it seems everyone in your life seems to stay away and ignore me, so I get no support from my family or close people in your life. I feel all alone to try and get through this difficult time when they should be here trying to help get me through this with compassion and love. I'm, I'm really sorry to, to hear that, Rose. Um, yeah, you know, uh, one thing that I've noticed a lot whenever people go through a, a traumatic experience, I see this most often with uh, death in somebody's life. Um, you know, the news breaks, the person passed away, and everybody's there. People are dropping 
puff casseroles left and right. Um, people are visiting the house, they're checking in on you. And that happens for the first week or so. Then there are a handful of other people who kind of stick around for the next month. But really after that, everybody else just kind of thinks that you're fine. It's not so much that they uh, don't care, it's that they're just not aware that this process is still ongoing. And I see this with people who, who have these kind of long-term sicknesses as well, that you know, oftentimes right when it all breaks, everybody's like, oh no, I gotta check in on her and see how she's doing, make sure she's got everything taken care of. But four years in, it, people just think that you're kind of fine, um, but you're not, right? You're still going through a, a, a lot of difficulty. It's, it's still a time of suffering um, and you need the support. And they're staying away, not because they don't love you, but because they just don't know how to love you. And so, um, you know, communicating clearly to those people, first off, hey, you know what, like, this is something that is still hard for me. And specifically, these things are hard. Um, would you be willing to support me or to help me in this way? And, you know, be really concrete about it, ask them to help out and even kind of set it on a schedule, you know, I need to help once a week getting to this doctor's appointment or you know can you can you bring me just a lasagna once a week so that I can have some food um, something like that and, and try and uh, spread it out among a lot of different people because if you have been suffering for four years you know um, obviously that's something that's much more difficult than most people's lives however everybody has difficult things in their life and everybody ends up getting busy and so if you show up to someone and you say I need you to be my sole caretaker until I die or until this cancer goes away. That's kind of overwhelming and people are like, well, wait, wait, wait a second. I don't know if I can do all of that. But if you just ask them to do something really concrete, hey, I need some help on the food front. I need some help on the transportation front. I need just someone to talk to. Um, can, can we meet and talk? You know, let's grab lunch once every two weeks and I can just kind of update you and you know, ask for your prayers. And, and we can do that. And oftentimes people are willing to commit to something like that, um, especially when you make it clear to them that, that you really need that um, in, this, in this difficult time in your life. Good question, Rose. Um, yeah, and she says, I pray to God uh, that he send me good and um, passionate people in my life to help and support me. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. And so Pauline says, hello, bless you. In, yeah, in your prayers. So just praying for everybody as well. Good. So um, that is all of the comments that I have got on the feed. And um, so uh, let's go ahead and wrap up with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. God bless. Happy Sunday.